God. No one else can take your place. And come let me see. No one else can take your place. Come have your way. No one else can take your place. We're going to sing that again in just a, just a few seconds, but I want us to do something really quick. We all, we come in to church, we come in the Sunday mornings, a lot of us carrying a whole bunch of stuff. And it's kind of like a weird juxtaposition, like we, we believe God can do things, but in the meantime, we're just going to hold it real tight until he does. I want to invite you this morning to open your hands up. Open your hands up as a sign that you're ready to receive something. And as a sign that says, I can't hold it anymore. God, you can have your way. You can flood this space. Nothing can replace you. There's a God-sized void in my heart, in my soul, in my life that I need you to fill, and I'm done trying to do it on my own. Come flood this place. Let's sing it again. Come flood this space. No one, no one else can take your place. Come have way. No one else. No one else can take your place. Jesus, come flood. Come flood this no one else can take your place. And come have your way. In every way. No one else. One more time. One more time. One more time. Come flood. And come flood this space.
and your matches. the delight of meeting you. My name is Jordan and I'm on the team here. Um, and when Terrell was just singing that everything bows, everything has to bow. I just want y'all to know that it is God's mercy that triumphs over judgment. His mercy triumphs over judgment, which means it benefits the Lord to be merciful to you more than it does for him to judge you. I said it benefits the Lord for him to be merciful to you more than it does for him to judge you. And I think it's easy for us to come to a church service or watch online and kind of think, okay, like I'm just gonna try really hard to not get in trouble. I'm gonna try not to think a bad thought. I did something bad yesterday, but here I am on Sunday. That is not how it works with the Lord. That's not who he is, that's not his character. We just sang this amazing song about how wonderful God is, how beautiful he is, how glorious he is, how matchless he is. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we're getting to know. That's the God who we're responding to. So when we come to this moment of worship and now we're in an offering moment, we, we don't worship and sing songs to the Lord. We don't give because we're freaked out. We give because he's good and because God is merciful, amen. One of my favorite stories is in Luke chapter 18. 
and it's a parable of a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, Pharisees are the people who were super religious, did all the right things, ticked off the boxes. They were never late to a Sunday morning service. They gave every week. These were like the people you would think would be the best religious people, right? Tax collectors were hated. They did the wrong thing. They were known to be cheaters. They were liars. They were hated in the Jewish community, right? So Jesus tells this parable, and I'll spare you most of the details. But the Pharisee prays and he says, God, I thank you that I am unlike, I'm not like other men, extortioners, the unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. That's what the Pharisee says, right? He's like, here's a list of all the things I've done right. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And this is what Jesus said. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For those of you who have done all the right things, but you know in your heart, God, I need you. For those of you who know you have done all the wrong things, but in your heart, you're like, God, I need you. As we come to this offering moment, the four ways to give will be up on the screen. Say to yourself, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the God who is merciful, the God who is just, the God who is kind will be gracious toward you. Amen, amen. Church, how are you guys doing today? <laughs> yes, love the energy, love hearing you. Um, my name is Eddie Hoagland. I have the privilege of serving here on staff as one of the pastors. 
And I kind of oversee two main areas. One is young adults. And so, yes, we do have a young adult ministry, if you did not know that. We meet on Tuesday nights. So this Tuesday night, if you want to come, uh, 7 o'clock in the World Prayer Center, we're going to be meeting there. And uh, so I oversee that ministry, lots of fun things going on there. And I also now help oversee the worship across all our congregations. And I am loving it, just love being here in Colorado Springs. Look, we moved here from Chicago. My wife, Christina, who's here in the front row, and then our three kids, Daniela. Yeah, much love for the fam. Daniela, Raphael, and Fiona. Here's a picture of us this past Easter here. Um, and that is a beautiful woman. And that are, that's three really cute kids. You are correct. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for acknowledging that. Um, and that's my family. We moved here from Chicago last year, just last year. And if any of you moved here from the Midwest, you know, you know how beautiful it is here, okay? It is so beautiful in Colorado Springs. Honestly, I have yet to see a pigeon since we moved here. <laughs> there, there's no pigeons. We don't have pigeons. We have magpies here, which are basically like cute little thin penguins that can fly. Like, how? <laughs> How awesome is that? <laughs> and and I've, I have not seen any stray dogs yet. We don't have stray dogs here. We have stray bunnies. <laughs> this is real. What I'm saying is real. We have stray bunnies with their baby bunnies hopping to and fro through our gardens, you know, bringing the joy of the Lord for us. I mean, this place is just cute. I love living here. I love living in Colorado. But more than Colorado Springs, I, I love New Life Church. Woo! I am... Man, I am so thankful to get to be a part of this church, and I have found some of the most loving people here in this community, loving people who love Jesus. That's, that's what I have found here, and the way that you guys have embraced me, the way that you guys have embraced my family, it, it really means the world to me. So thank you. Thank you for being that church who's, who's embraced us completely. Now here today, my job is to bring to you a word from the Lord. In the time when McDonald's is giving you a 1-800 number saying, how was your Big Mac experience? Or, you know, the bus driver in front of you has a number you're supposed to call saying, how's my driving? You know what I'm talking about? And it's just like, all we're constantly being told today is, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And that's not my job here today. My job is to do what every pastor has to do every single Sunday and say, what does God say? What does God say about the matter? And I, with you, am standing under the authority of God's word and trust me, if we, if we dive in here, we will hear from God. And I'm asking him to speak to us. And so in honor of God's word, uh, would you stand with me as we get started here this morning? I'm going to be reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. It says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Here it is. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for your word. Thank you that you did not leave us here alone on this planet. You sent us your spirit. But then you, you called us and you saved us into a people. Thank you that we're here gathered as your people. And we're asking God, we're coming with open hands, open hearts, and saying, would you speak? Would you accomplish what you want to accomplish? God, that's all I want to happen today. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> we lay down all our plans, any agenda we have. We just say, we let that go right now, God. And we say, would you accomplish what you want to accomplish here today? And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray this. And all God's people said, amen. 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 You can take a seat. All right. Well, here is, I came to basically tell you one thing today. 
And, and the one thing is the title of my, of my message, and I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes basically making a case that this sentence is true. Here it is. God is worthy of your faith. God is worthy of your faith. So let's start by defining faith because I want to make sure we all agree and understand what we're talking about exactly. Today, when we say the word faith, it could mean a lot of things, right? It could mean some sort of belief in any God and kind of in any way. That's not what we're talking about here today. Let's go back to how the writer of Hebrews describes it to us. He would say it in this way, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. There's kind of two sides of faith that the writer describes. One is, it's whose hand you're putting your future in. It's the looking forward saying, all of my future, I'm going to bank in this or this person for my future, that's faith. But then it's also who you're ultimately trusting in and relying on for today. Just how do you live your life? How, how do you make decisions? That's who you're putting your faith in because we all believe in something. Every single one of you, you walked in here today, you believe in something. And if you're arguing with me and you're like, Eddie, no, I, I just kind of don't believe in anything. Well, I would say the only reason you think you can believe in nothing is because you've elevated yourself to be the ultimate definer of truth. And that's why you can believe in nothing. So we all believe in something and we're all deriving meaning from something. How do we make sense of this universe? <laughs> How do we know what's up from down? How do we know left from right? It's because of what we put our faith in that we derive meaning. That's how we find purpose. That's how we find direction in this life. And let me say this, what you put your faith in will affect all areas of your life. I'm not talking today just about something that's a portion of your life, where I'm not saying something that's in your brain or in your heart. I'm talking about something that affects all areas of your life. Every relationship you have, it's affected by what you put your faith in. Every, every thought, every decision, every career move, all those things are affected by what or who you put your faith in. And some of us, we don't like the idea of putting our faith in an invisible God. It doesn't sit well with us. He, we can't see him with these eyes, and so we, we, we'd rather put our faith in things that are visible. We find our hearts prone to wander in that direction, and so we'll put our faith in other things. We'll put our faith in relationships, and we'll say, you know, as long as my parents approve of my life, then everything's fine. Or as long as I'm still dating this person, all, all is well. <laughs> Or as long as I'm still in this friend group, that's where I'm banking my future on. That's where I'm ultimately trusting and relying on them for my well-being today. And that's putting your faith in relationships. Now, God wants great relationships for you, okay? I'm not saying those are bad things. What I'm saying is you're not supposed to put your faith in that. That's not where you're supposed to put your faith. You're supposed to seek to have those things in light of faith in God. And some of us, we'd rather put it in a relationship or some of us, we'd rather put it on our career. You know, like, maker's gonna make, like, let's go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hustle, I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna get that promotion, I'm gonna make the most I can make, and again, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I want you to have a great career, I want you to have, uh, you know, make good money, all that's good. But that's not where you put your faith in. Many of us in this room, we, you, you've seen what it's like to put your faith in your career, and then your career fails you. And sometimes, because you did nothing wrong, you were doing all the right things, and yet it still fails you. Because it's not meant to hold your faith. That's why it's failing you. And, and some of us, we wouldn't put it there or in relationships, we'll put it in the government. And we'll say, you know, we have to, we're, as a Christian, it's not just voting for what we believe would be best, it's more than that. It's I'm trusting the government to deliver on my future. My future belongs to the government. And that's why, that's why I think our conversations over politics and government have gotten so heated. And they're so aggressive, why? Because as you and I have a different opinion, I'm kind of attacking your future. And if I'm attacking your future, well then it's like, well okay, fists up, like let's do this. You know, I'm gonna defend my future. But look, my future does not belong to the government. My future belongs to Jesus Christ alone. He's the one I'm, I'm trusting my future with because all those things, everything I just said, they're all good things. Okay, hear me clearly. I'm not anti anything I just mentioned. But no one can bear the weight of your faith except for God. No one besides God can bear the weight of your faith, of you banking your future on him, and you putting ultimate trust and reliance. Because when you don't, 
When you don't put it in God and you put it somewhere else, here's what happens. You hurt yourself and you hurt whoever else you're putting your faith in. You hurt the other party. This is not for your good because no one besides God can bear the weight of your faith. And God is worthy of that. He's the one worthy of it because he cares about you. God cares about you. He really does, and part, part of growing in your faith is to see and acknowledge that God is both, God is awesome, and God is near. God's both those things, okay? Those aren't contradicting. God is awesome, he spoke, and everything we see today, it all came to be because he spoke. And he's the one who stands above it all as the sovereign, one true king, and he's perfect in every way, and he's holy in every way. That's God, he's not like us in these ways. He is awesome in power and glory, that's God. But that same God is near. He's close to you. The psalmist says it like this in Psalm 34 verse 18 when he says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. If you would have grown up in the Hebrew culture, when you hear the word heart, brokenhearted, you would think my desires. My desires, that's my heart, what I want out of life. The word we would use today is dreams. <laughs> it's my dreams. That's what, I, what I'm hoping to get out of life. And what God says is, when your dreams are broken, when the expectation that you had on life is completely shattered, have you been there? I've been there. When that happens, God's answer is to come closer. He doesn't run away. He says, I'm right here. The implication of the God of the universe coming close to you, what he wants you to hear is this. He cares. He cares. He really does. God cares about you. And we all have highs and lows in life. We all have different expectations. And so let me just share with you a little bit about, about me and my story. I grew up in Mexico City, Mexico. Uh, my parents are missionaries there. They're still there. Uh, they're going to come visit here in a, in a couple weeks. Can't wait to have them. And um, so, yes, I, I do speak Spanish. Y es un gusto estar aquí con ustedes en la Iglesia Nueva Vida. Yo soy, yo soy mexicano. Soy chilango, chilango, y, y nací debajo de un nopal. Eso es lo que les voy a decir hoy. Now, everyone else is like, what is going on? <laughs> so if you don't know what I just said, then I'll, I'll refer you to Pastor Daniel's message last week, and just go on YouTube. It'll all make sense once you watch that sermon, all right? Um, so yes, I grew up in a church, about 250, 300 people, somewhere around there, and I'm so thankful for my parents. They, they did a great job. Um, appropriately sharing with us as children uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly in church. And the reason I'm so thankful for that is because of the work that they did as parents, I have a love for the local church today. And, and I've seen the highs and lows, I've seen all that, and I still have such a love for local church ministry. I, I feel like I love it more today than I did back then. And, and by the time, you know, I, I'm born in the church, Raised in the church, served in the church. I mean, when you're a pastor's kid, you do everything. It's like, anybody need anyone? Pastor's kid will do it. Like, that's just how it is, especially in a small church. And by the time I'm 18, I am as connected as you can get in community. I, I really felt extremely connected to my community. I mean, it was my family, my church family, my friends. Um, everything was just going good. I loved high school, you know? High school was awesome. And I, I went from being very, very connected, very, very known, and then I decide to move to the United States to get a, a degree in worship leadership. So we moved to Virginia, we drove there, so it took about two weeks to get there, and uh, as we're driving up, I, I, went I went through a transition of being super connected to being super not connected. Because I, and, and some of you guys have experienced this, when you, when you cross a culture, when you you know, the language is different. And, and yes, I spoke English. My dad's American. Like, I, it wasn't a language barrier for me, but culturally, it was very different. Um, you have to remember, like, just because you speak English doesn't mean you understand the American culture. That's a, a different thing you have to learn. Like, I, I went to college, and they were calling someone a tool, and I was like, oh, that means they're useful, you know? And <laughs> that's, that's not quite true, as I've come to find out. 
Um, so, so there's all these differences and, and things that you probably wouldn't ever think of. And I, I leave my culture, I leave my family, and, and I just, I've never felt more alone in my life than that year. That's by far the loneliest year of my life was 2006 to 2007, my freshman year of college. And I mean, even telling you this story, I can still feel it in my stomach, what I'm describing. And if you've ever been at that point where you're like, I, I don't know how to continue with this level of loneliness. I, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do because to top it off, I'm an introvert. And I know, you know, everyone thinks if you're preaching like you're an extrovert, that's, that's not true, trust me. I'm not an extrovert. I, I don't walk into a room of people I don't know and I'm like, yay, like that, that is the opposite of me. I am like, hey, one-on-one -on -one conversation, that's great. I'm good with all that. It's just like, I'm not excited to be around a ton of people I don't know. And so add that to the fact that I'm now in a foreign place and foreign people and no one knows me, like no one knows me. And I just walk into this dorm and just trying to figure out life. And it was one night, I remember, I had parked my car in the student parking lot, and I was walking back towards my dorm. And as I'm walking, I just begin to wrestle a bit with God. And, and I didn't ask God for anything specific. I just kind of asked the question, God, where are you in this? Like, where, where are you as I feel this way? And that was that. I, I didn't hear anything from God. I just expressed where I was at in life and kept walking. And I walked by the intramural field, and there was a bunch of people playing frisbee, I think, and, and I kind of stood on the sideline of the field, and I'm standing next to a bunch of people, and no one introduces themselves to me, and I don't introduce myself to anyone, so I just kind of stand there looking around, and then I was like, well, this isn't, this isn't doing anything, so let's keep walking, so then I kept walking towards my dorm, and as I walked towards my dorm, a, a group of people crossed, crossed paths, literally, with me, and someone in the group looked at me, and they're like, hey, what's your name? And I was like super shocked at that question. And then I think, I don't have, I kind of have a blurry memory. I think I said Eddie, I hope I did. Um, and, then, and then after that, uh, the second question shocked me even more. It was, hey, would you like to go to dinner with us? And I know it doesn't sound like a big deal, but can I just tell you where, where I was at in life? That was a really, really big deal to me. And so I was like, sure. And so I hop in the car and, and we drive off campus. I think we went to Sonic and, uh, and we're eating dinner there, um, eating terrible fried food. And then and I had this moment while I was sitting there eating because the reason this story is significant is not because of the group of friends. Like they didn't end up being my friend group. And it's not significant because, you know, the person who asked me my name ended up being my wife, Christina, later. Like, it's not that. that. That's not the story. The reason the story is so significant is because I sat there at Sonic, and it was clear as day. God cares. God cares. And that's a word for someone in this room here today. That's a word for someone you needed to hear today. God cares not just about the world. God cares about you. Okay? And maybe I had my walk from the parking lot to my dorm, and that's where God showed me that he cared. And maybe you parked in that parking lot, and you're walking into this room with a similar experience. Out of all the Sundays you could have been here, out of all the sermons you could have heard, out of all the churches you could have chosen to attend, you're here, and I believe it's because God wants you to hear this. He cares about you. God cares about you. And he cares so much that he's not trying to play tricks on you, he's not trying to fool you, he's not trying to hide from you. God is worthy of your faith because he cares about you and because he can be found. God can be found, and that's good news. You don't have to quit your job today and you know fly across the country on this journey to find God. You don't have to do that. You can find God right now. God is not hiding from you. Now, just because he's the invisible God, that doesn't mean he can't be found. But the way you're going to find him is by faith and not by sight. 
This is how God has established our relationship with him to be. It's not by sight. And I know we're all kind of like, why? <laughs> Wouldn't it be better if we could just see God with these eyes and like, and then everyone would, no one would claim I believe in something fake. Like we would all have to acknowledge he's real. And it's like, we try to argue with God that sight would kind of be better than faith, God. Like, uh, could we try that for a little bit? Like, let's try the sight thing instead of faith. But here's the thing. If God created our relationship to be this way in communion with him by faith, you can believe that that's the best way to be in relationship with God. Because when you think about it, sight is limited. Sight has restrictions, and I just believe sight is so much smaller than what God wants to do in your life by faith. Faith is a path. Faith is a way that God can be found. And Matthew 7, 7 and 8, Jesus says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks. So who, who receives? Who receives? That verse is teaching us something. Everyone who asks receives. Who receives? Everyone. Yeah, it's not a trick question. Everyone's like, oh, I don't want to answer. No, everyone receives. Everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, the door will be open. And that is why when the writer of Hebrews in verse 6, this all starts to make a lot more sense. Verse, verse 6 says this, and without faith, without saying those things, without believing those things, it's impossible to please God. You can't have a relationship with him without faith. Faith is the essential ingredient for you to have a relationship with God. Because anyone who comes to him, and he says these two things, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Those who earnestly seek him. You want to exercise your faith? Try these two things. Believe that God exists and earnestly seek him. Let's get practical. How do we do that? How do I seek God? Well, here's just a few very simple ways that you can seek God today. First thought, talk to him. Talk to God just like you would talk to me. No different than that. Talk to God the way you would talk to me. Because if we're exercising our faith, we have to acknowledge that he exists. And what better way to acknowledge that God exists than to talk to him? Your talking to him is an exercise of faith, saying, I believe someone's out there listening. And God is listening. And you're exercising your faith in, by talking to him. Another thing you can do is read his word. Read his word. I know so many times in church we think it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Bible, right? That's the third part of the Trinity. Well, no, this, I don't know if this is news for any of you. This book is not God. This book is the revelation of God from God. And it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so when the Spirit speaks through these words, that's what you're experiencing. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you're like, I don't know if I've ever experienced the Holy Spirit in my life. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever heard or read anything in the Bible that just jumped out at you? You know, just grabbed a hold of you. If you have, that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So anything that comes from this book is the ministry of God to you. And when you read it, you're going to learn two things. You're going to learn the voice of God, and you're going to learn the character of God. So you go through these stories, and you're like, okay, so what's going on here, Israel, like in the Old Testament? And what will happen is you read the stories, and then at the end of the story, you'll think, oh, God's kind of like that. God's kind of like that because of how he treated them. And then you see how he treats the prophets, and you find out God kind of, God cares about these things. God, God's grieved by this. God's, God rejoices over this. You learn things about God, and that's why you're seeking him by reading this book. Then you get to the New Testament, and you're like, wow, look at how Jesus talked to that person. God's like this. God's like this. So you seek him by reading the word. One more thought on seeking God, and this one might catch you off guard. You seek God by spending time with his people. You seek God by spending time with his people. That one might catch you off guard because you're like, well, no, no, I, I'm seeking God. I'm not seeking church. It, it has to do with God. Well, here, here newsflash, like it, those things are interwoven. Um, God saves you into a family and God has very, very specific things to say about people who claim to love God and hate their brother and sister. God's not having any of that, okay? He's very, very clear about this. And the way you seek him is by spending time in fellowship with God's people. That's why I come every Sunday. 
That's the reason behind it, just so you know. It's not because someone's taking attendance back there or, you know, someone's like making sure I follow some rule. That's not why. I, I come every Sunday because on the Sundays where my faith is weak, the way I seek God is by gathering with his people, and you're actually strong for me. You help me seek God because, and that's not going to happen unless I gather with you. So that's why I love coming to church every single Sunday. But for some of you, I know, I know that saying that one of the ways to seek God is to spend time with his people, that's, that's a hard message for some of you in the room. Because you've been hurt by God's people. And first, let me just say, I, I'm sorry if that's you. I, I've been hurt by God's people too. I'm sorry that that happened. But there has to be a way forward that doesn't involve leaving all of this. There has to be a way forward. I mean, think about it. By definition, if we're all a work in progress, anybody want to say, like, oh, not me. Like, got this together. Like, that's not, no one in this room would claim that. So if we're all a work in progress, well, by definition, there's going to be times we hurt each other. It's going to happen. I cannot promise you that will never happen again in your life. So the question is, how do we move forward? Well, I believe the Lord's saying, the way my church is going to move forward, first, it's they have to reject culture's definition of love and the practice of love, and they have to br- embrace mine. And the more time I spend studying the New Testament and the way God talks about love, and I'm like, man, if I just do that, so many other things get solved. If I really do live out what love is in the New Testament, so many other things get solved. So I know love's going to be the way forward, but forgiveness is also the way forward. There are some things that we will never be able to overcome as brother and sister in Christ unless we forgive. Some of the most shocking verses in the New Testament have to do with forgiveness. This is a little homework. Go check them out sometime. You're like, what? (laughs) Jesus said what? Yeah, this is a really big deal. And we have to forgive each other in the way the Bible teaches forgiveness. Okay, so I'm not throwing in some sort of blanket statement. I was just like, get over it. No, that's not what forgiveness is. But forgive and study and say, what did Jesus teach forgiveness is? And and that's how you earnestly seek him. See, the seeking is not just, you know, entry-level seeking. We're talking earnest seeking. So if you're like, yeah, okay, spend time more with God's people. So I came to church, I stood in the service, and I kind of didn't, you know, not much happened. Well, seek earnestly. (laughs) Don't just seek. Seek earnestly. Like, actually care and say, God, I'm going to do this and this and that. I'm going to do all those things, and I'm going to lean in, and I can tell you to do that because I know that God will meet you there. He straight up says, draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. And God's worthy of your faith. One of the reasons is because he can be found. He cares about you and he can be found. And then this, God's worthy of your faith because he's constant. He is constant. Man, I, I love this about God. God's constant. God's kind of like, he's like the dad who never misses a game. God's like the mom who stays up late waiting for you to come home because she wants to have a conversation with you and spend time with you. God's like that friend who stayed with you when it seems like everybody else was happy to walk away. God's like that because God is constant. And no one will ever be as constant as God in your life. You know, the past two years, what we experienced was the world taking away anything we thought was constant. It was like, we'll take that. That's what the last couple years has been like. It's like, oh my gosh, what can I hold on to? Well, one of the benefits of going through the last two years is that it is revealed very clearly that no one will ever be as constant as God. All the things I mentioned earlier, your relationships, your career, the government, all those things in one way or another, they're going to fail you. But God will be constant. And... And because God is constant, his promises are constant. Anything he speaks to you is also constant. One of the things we've said in our family a few times over the years is this phrase, don't forget in the dark what God said to you in the light. Don't forget in the dark what God said to you in the light. You know, at my last church I was at in Chicago, I spent over 10 years in worship ministry. That's what what I studied in undergrad, that's what I took a job in, and I was a music director, then a worship leader, then a worship pastor. 
And so that's why you guys still see me up here occasionally uh, serving on the worship team because I just love serving in worship ministry. Um, but after, you know, about being there for seven years, seven or eight years, our church went through uh, an incredibly diff difficult leadership transition. And when I say leadership tra transition, I mean like pastors leaving, uh, senior team leaving, uh, elders leaving. I'm talking like massive, massive change in a very small amount of time. And some of you, you've walked through this, so you know exactly the feelings, you know the experience of what that's like. And when you're in those moments of change that's fast, it's just honestly, it's just a mess. And when you're standing in that mess, you're kind of like, I, what's up from down? And, and that's where we were at as a church. Like the, the congregation was like, we have no idea who we can trust anymore. Like, we don't even know if I can believe that or that. It's like, I felt that in the congregation. And then at the staff level working at the church, the staff was kind of like, where are we going now? <laughs> like, where, you know, wh what's the direction of this church? Like, we had no sense of where we were supposed to go. And then we had to navigate all our conversations about, well, this person's to blame for the mess. No, this person's to blame for that mess. And like, all those conversations started going. Some of you can really relate to that. And one of the things that happened in that season is that they asked me to join the new leadership team at the church and uh, kind of step up into that role. And when your church is hurting and they ask you to help, you help. That's what you're supposed to do. And so I jump in and I start just doing what I can and trying to help the staff answer some questions and try to give a little bit of guidance on like, here's where we're gonna go, here's what we're gonna do and, and try to help the congregation na navigate these really difficult questions that were being presented and part of taking that role as a leader, what ended up happening through a pretty awesome and bizarre set of events is I got asked to preach for the first time. And interestingly enough, the first time I got asked to preach was three years ago to this weekend. <laughs> so when they asked me to preach, I was like, of course it's this weekend, right? <laughs> of course it's gonna be this weekend. And three years ago, I started preaching and, and look, that I don't know if that was a good sermon, bad sermon, it wasn't bad or even amazing. I just know that what happened that night greatly exceeded anything I could have done. And it was so clear to me, God was saying, hey, I'm adding this to your calling, I want you to preach. And I'm like, well, I've been in worship ministry and God's like, no, you're gonna preach. <laughs> And so I was like, okay, Lord. So then I start taking on more and then I start taking on more responsibilities. More people will resign and I'd be like, okay, fine. I'll oversee that department and that department and I'll take over the preaching calendar. Like I'll, I'm doing all these things. And the more I added, the harder and harder it got and the weightier and weightier everything got. And then came 2020 and in 2020, I made a mistake, which I've made before in my life. And that is that I, I thought walking with Jesus and sprinting for Jesus were the same thing. You think, well, I'm working for God, right? Like someone has to do this in church. Like I'll just keep doing more and more and more. And, and there I am sprinting for Jesus. And what happened in 2020 is like, I'm running this way. And there was a brick wall right here and I run smack into it. And I fall to the ground. And as I'm lying there, the thoughts going through my mind are, I don't think I'll ever be able to do this again. I think I might have already preached my last sermon. And that's what's going through my mind. But never forget in the dark what God has said to you in the light. Never forget in the dark what God has said to you in the light. He is constant, therefore his promises are constant. He is constant, therefore his word is constant. And I'm here to tell you today, I'm standing here preaching to you as a testimony. Not that I was strong enough. Not that I just picked myself up and kept going. I am standing here to tell you, God is constant. That's why I'm here to tell you, God is constant. Come on, hey, let's all stand together as we come to a close. God's constant and he's in the business of resurrection. Resurrection is when something's dead, God says, I'll bring it to life. There are things that you think are hopeless. God would like you to believe again. And when you believe it, here's what happens. You declare it. When you believe it, you declare it. It's not something that stays inside of you. If you have faith, it comes out of you. It comes out of your mouth, your hands, your feet, wherever. <laughs> it, it just, it's got to come out when it's faith. When you believe it, you declare it. But then I've also found this. 
even if your faith is weak, when you declare it, you start to believe it again. So if you believe it today, I'm going to invite you right now. We're going to all declare this together. What are we declaring? That God's worthy of our faith. So I'm going to ask you a few questions at the end. If you believe it, declare. You're going to declare by saying, I believe. And whether you're standing in this room or you're watching online or on video anywhere, you can be a part of this. Anyone, for everyone who seeks, can receive. All right, here we go. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? If you believe, say, I believe. Do you believe in Christ Jesus, the Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made, who came down from heaven, was born of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin, and was made man, who was crucified and died and rose again at the third day, living among the dead, and ascended unto heaven, and sat at the right hand of the Father, and who will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. If you believe, say, I believe. All right. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father? If you believe, say, I believe. Finally this, do you believe in the Holy Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come? If you believe that, say, I believe. Come on, lift up your voice. Say, I believe. All right, somebody, got, somebody give God praise in this place. We give you praise, Lord. We're going to sing in faith. Come on. nothing better than God. No one else who's worthy of that faith. And the message I just preached kind of begs a question. <laughs> if you're saying that, that God can resurrect things, how did God do that? Here's how he did it. You're holding in your hands now the way, the reminder of the way that Jesus did it. When we thought it was all hopeless, he said, I'll step in, I'll do it. And I'll give my body and I'll give my blood so that they can be with me and I can be with them. So as you hold this wafer in your hand, we remember that on the night that Jesus, Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and he said, this cup is the blood of my new covenant 
shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. And the Bible tells us that after they had eaten of the bread and drank of the cup, they sang a hymn. So let's let this song be our hymn today. Tell him there's nothing better. I'm so glad that you chose to come to church today. I'm really glad that you are here. And as we come to the close of our service, there's just a few things I wanted to make sure everyone knows. First, if you're new around here, hey, right through those middle doors, there's this area called Connect Central. You can't miss it. And the point of that space is for you to have any questions you have answered, meet someone who's on our team. Um, we know it's a big room. And how does that big room get really small? Go right there, okay? So if you're new here, we'd love to meet you. We'd love for you to spend some time with with uh, people there at Connect Central. Also, if, if you came in here and there's something you need prayed over and you're like, I, I'm, I feel like it's on my shoulders and, and I'm not supposed to carry this. Well, one of the ways we can carry that together is if you let us pray for you. So um, prayer team, I'm gonna go ahead and invite them to come forward. They'll line the front of the stage. And then as soon as we're done here, if there's anything you need prayer for, please give us the, the honor and the privilege of praying with you. Well, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we got some exciting things coming this summer. We have Kids Camp and we have Desperation Conference. So we got ministry happening with our kids and with our students. And um, here, here's what I want you to hear. Uh, we want you to get registered. There's tables in the lobby, all that. But if money is gonna get in the way of your children being a part of this, like, please don't let that be. Just tell someone at the table. We will figure out a way. We will bless you. There's scholarships. We want the ministry to happen. That's what this summer's about. And, and what, if, what if we actually believed God for some things this summer? Let's not just make summer 2022 just any old summer. Let's, let's ask God to do things in our kids' lives and in our students' lives that, that he will resurrect things that are already dying inside of them. And so we're gonna believe God and we're just gonna get rid of anything that could get in the way of that ministry. All right, so you can go in the lobby and sign up for that. All right, well, before we head out today, um, I just wanna bless you. So why don't we just open our hands May you go knowing and experiencing more and more that God is worthy of your faith. May you go knowing that as you place your faith in him, he will draw closer to you. And may you go with faith that doesn't stay inside of you. Go now and take this faith to the world, bringing the good news of Jesus and the good of Jesus to the world. And do this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So good to be with you. We'll see you next week.